thanks, Guy, and thanks, everyone, for turning up, um, in particular the people who have come from Winchester and the people who are en route somewhere in Southampton. Um, it's not the nicest weather for travelling around, so I do appreciate you turning up, and I hope you get something from this. Um, OK. Uh, every now and again, uh, nature transpires to remind us that we owe our ways of life, and sometimes our very lives, to the environment remaining within really relatively narrow bounds. A storm like this could kill many thousands of people, could produce damage estimated uh, in the millions, if not billions, of pounds to repair. And uh, Guy has already mentioned that there's uh, a perfect storm approaching. John Beddington, the chief scientific advisor to the UK government, has coined this term. Um, and he's trying to capture um, a number of factors which are all going to hit us at the same time. And it's the combination of these factors that somehow we need to address. And this is the start of the global challenges. Um, in a way, we can see it's driven by population. There's, uh, seven billion, there are 7 billion people on planet Earth at the moment. Every month, that increases about 6 million. By the middle of this century, there's going to be about 8 billion people. All these people will need to be fed. Um, we need to find uh, the space to grow the crops. Um, by the middle of the century, we might need to be growing 50% more food, because not only will there be more people to feed, but people are eating more. They're not just getting big and obese, but they're actually being drawn out of uh, starvation and poverty. And we will need to power the systems which grow our food and keep the lights on in our civilization. And as we know, fossil fuels are, are a limited resource, and they're running out. And just that when they're running out, we need to find the systems to replace them. And we need to do that really rather quickly. Finding the space to grow all the food, to feed the people that are going to live, means that we're having an impact on biodiversity and ecosystems. We're increasingly removing natural systems and replacing them with you know, monoculture and urban spaces. And that's having an effect on biodiversity. <coughs> we could be going through a mass extinction event at the moment. Uh, many thousands of times greater than the background extinction event. And it's only been comparatively recently that we begin to quantify the actual services in dollar terms that natural systems provide. Um, they can protect coastal areas from storms, they purify our water, they can stabilise slopes, uh, they're responsible for providing the areas in which fish grow and then we eat. Now, if we denude these systems so far so that these systems don't do those services anymore, then somehow we're going to have to do the service on nature's behalf, and that's going to cost a lot of money. Where's that money going to come from? We don't know. And speaking of money, the world financial system uh, is increasingly connected. Uh, there are increasing flows of trade and goods and services across the world, and this highly connected system represents problems in and of itself. Which leads us on to notions of transnational governance. How do we, as individuals who live in uh, sovereign nation states, coordinate among ourselves so that we can fix all these kind of connected global issues? At the moment, um, individual nations act in some kind of state of nature. Maybe not a Hobbesian state of nature, but individual nations can pretty much do what they like. The legal frameworks that we've got in place are somewhat limited, so it's hard to understand how we're going to get all these different countries to coordinate. And then, lying on top of all these issues, is climate change. We're affecting the Earth's climate in ways which are not good, and that's going to exacerbate a whole range of these issues. And how do we address that? So the question is, how are we going to respond to these challenges? What do we need to do in order to make sure that we can not only live, but prosper in the future? So I'm going to start addressing that question by showing you a short film. This did the viral thing recently. You may have seen it before. Uh, this is the aftermath of a road traffic accident. A car has pulled out on a motorcycle, which, uh, well, that's what's left of it. It's on, on fire. The driver of the car is fine. He's out of the vehicle, but the rider of the motorcycle isn't. He's underneath. He's trapped there. Um, he's unresponsive. And some people have seen uh, the accident. Some people have just turned up. And this woman here is going to make a very important discovery. Uh, she can see that the guy is actually breathing. I think many of the people have assumed that he's already dead. And so they go back and uh, other people join in and people uh, come off screen. Apparently there was a construction site here where people were running to aid the person. And it's this guy here who has the foresight to grab the person's leg and then pull him out to safety. Uh, I cut the video there because it's a bit distressing. Uh, but the person does receive uh, some medical aid. The person under the car was a 21-year-old 
uh, University of Utah State student, uh, Brandon Wright, and this is him shortly afterwards. By all accounts, he's making a quite remarkable recovery. Now, I wanted to show you this because I think it tells us two things. The first thing is that people do actually care about strangers. Uh, none of these people knew Brandon. Uh, they, all they knew that there was an accident and that somebody was trapped underneath the car. And the second thing it says is that teams can do pretty amazing things. Individually, no one would have been able to lift the car up, but collectively, together, they all managed to lift the car right off, off the ground and they saved Brandon's life. Now, these are the starting assumptions for how I think we're going to address these global challenges. So my first assumption is that students actually care about the global challenges. They know about them, they're aware about them, and to a certain extent they are actually engaged with these issues. And the second one, in order to allow them to effectively engage, in order to allow them to actually make a difference, then multidisciplinary working, working together in teams which have a range of background, skills and experience, are going to be necessary. That's how we're going to address these challenges. And I suppose the final assumption is this realisation that we are affecting the Earth in ways which are not very good. I think this uh, encapsulates some of these changes. This is a 2009 nature study, um, and it identifies nine planetary boundaries. Uh, we've got uh, atmospheric aerosol loading, chemical pollution, climate change, ocean acidification, etc., etc. I mean, you can read, I hope. And what these little segments are showing us is that the human effects are in red, and for some of them, we're not really having much of an effect yet. Well, actually, that's because we haven't even quantified the effect. We don't know how to measure the effect we're having, but let's assume we're not really ruining it that much. And some we're beginning to go encroaching throughout these red areas, but then you see, you know, that some planetary boundary conditions, for example, climate change, the nitrogen cycle, which we seem to be affecting really significantly, and oops, biodiversity loss, were having a massive impact. Now, the way in which the Earth system is responding to these perturbations is not necessarily progressive or linear. You know, if we push it a little bit more, it's not necessarily going to change a little bit more. In fact, the changes might be really rather sudden and effectively irreversible. Once we pushed it so far, even if we stop pushing, it's not going to pick itself back up again. We've done something effectively irreversible to the system. And that's captured in the notion of tipping points. <coughs> Uh, 2008 PNS paper um, in which they identified a number of tipping elements in the Earth system. The kind of things that if we do push them too far, they will effectively collapse. They'll undergo a period of positive feedback and it'll be very hard to get the system back into the previous state. Maybe the classic one is Antarctic sea ice loss up there, right? So as, you, uh, as the Earth's climate warms, then the amount of ice up there starts to melt and uh, ice is very light, it's a uh, light colour, it reflects a lot of the energy from the sun and as it melts it uncovers a proportion of much darker seawater. That darker seawater then gets warmer which increases the rate of, free, of melting of the ice which then uh, exposes more seawater. There's a, like a positive feedback loop. You get a certain amount of melting and then there's a runaway feedback effect. So it could be that in the summer there won't be any Arctic icy left. So how did this happen? How do we as a species and then as a civilization, have such a profound effect on so many different bits of the Earth system such that we are in danger of actually effectively breaking them or doing things to them which will not be in our best interests? And the way I want to describe that or show that is with this great thing called gap minder. Some of you might have heard of Hans Rosling. He did a BBC uh, documentary uh, not so long ago called The Joy of Stats. Statistics doesn't sound very exciting, but he really did a, a tremendous job in bringing data to life. And uh, part of uh, the program used what's called the gap minder desktop, which isn't working. Hang on a sec, sorry here. Uh, ah, right. Oh, there you go. That wasn't too bad, was it? Right. So what this is um, going to show us is that rather than on a normal graph, you've got time here on the kind of the horizontal axis. What this is the income per person uh, from uh, about two hundred dollars all the way up to about forty thousand dollars, and then on this axis here, you've got life expectancy in years, and it goes all the way from twenty-five all the way up to eighty-five. And uh, we're going to show the data at the start of the 19th century, so 1800. 
And all these uh, little circles represent countries. The size of the circle represents the uh, population of the country. And you can see, around 1800, every country is around this bottom left-hand corner. People don't have a great deal of money, and they don't live for very long. Here's the United Kingdom here. And what we can do... Oh, right, OK, right, now, we're off. OK, so what we're going to see is um, European countries are curry- coloured in orange, uh, Asia in red, there's China, um, Americas in yellow, and Africa in blue. And you can see that there's now... Uh, United Kingdom is, to a certain extent, leading the way, and they're moving up. They're moving to the right, and they're going up. People are getting richer, and people are living longer. That dip there was, I think, the uh, First World War. And you can see the trend, right? All these countries are slowly being lifted out of poverty and also not very good qualities of life. Over here, people are dying around age 35 and they don't have much money. And now, as it stands in 2009, you can see there is a trend, which is nicely described by the United Kingdom, pretty much all the way up to this top right-hand side of the chart. Now, the question is... We obviously want to bring people out of poverty. We want to give them more money. We want to increase their qualities of life. We want them to live longer. But is this progressive increase to more money and longer lives and larger populations, is it sustainable? Well, uh, to start to talk about that, I want to show you a cartoon. This is the kind of thing that I find funny. Right? I find other things funny too, but this is certainly funny. This is a cartoon from Randall from XKCD. Now, this is like a normal plot to begin with. Right? We've got years over here, so 1960, 70, 80, 90, etc. And over on this axis, we're showing the frequency of the word sustainable in US English text. Now, in 1960, it's very small. There was basically no examples of texts which had the word sustainable in them. But as you can see, it's increasing and it's increasing very quickly, till now in the present day, we're somewhere under, I don't know, a hundredth of a percent. But look, if we were to continue that trend, by 2036, sustainable occurs on every page ever written, and however, by 2061, it's going to occur every sentence. And if we continue going on, by 2109, every single word in the English language will just be the word sustainable, repeated over and over again. Now... This shows us that the use of the word sustainable is not sustainable. And the reason it's not sustainable is because, if you look closely here, whilst this goes up in regular increments of 10, this doesn't. This isn't a linear axis, it's a logarithmic axis. So the distance between this point and this point is 0.1, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3. But the distance here is 1, 2, 3, and the distance here is 10, 20, 30. It's a logarithmic axis. And this logarithmic linear plot is showing us that the increase in the word sustainable is exponential. This is the only bit of mass that I'm going to show. Right? The exponential function is here. And there's two other functions. There's uh, the linear function. And you know it's a real linear function now because the uh, increases here are the same and the increases here. This is going up by 250 each one. This is going up by one every time. And so this red function is basically whatever x is, y is 50 times more. Uh, and the blue function is a cubic. So it's, uh, for example, if x is 3, then y is 3 times 3 times 3, which is 27. Um, if x is 10, then y is 1,000. And you can see for a range of x values, they're actually quite a lot higher than the green exponential function. But after a while, this thing takes off. And when, x, uh, when y is a function of x such that it's 2 to the power of x, then this is telling us that the values are doubling every time. And the doubling might take a long time to get started, but when it does, it really does shoot off. So the classic example is bacteria reproduction. Um, a regular e. Coli, e. coli bacteria weighs, I don't know, several milligrams or something, and it will reproduce as long as it has enough food every 20 minutes or so. So after 20 minutes, there's two little tiny E. coli bacteria, and after 40 minutes, there's four. If you wait long enough, let's say you wait about a day, 24 hours, and let's assume you've got enough food to feed them, the mass of all those E. coli bacteria will be greater than the mass of the planet Earth. And so what we always understand with exponential functions is they can't go on like that forever. They have to be bounded some way. They need to slow down. So... This is the world population in billions. 
uh, over the last, well, 12,000 years or so. So, so. Is that me? Okay. The place isn't haunted, is it? <laughs> um, I've offended the gods of Knox. <laughs> right, so, um, oh, pretty much, well, for a very long uh, period of human history, or oh, even 10,000 BC to around, I don't know, you know, 4,000, 2,000 BC, uh, the world population of humans was, you know, bobbling around in the order of millions. However, something really exceptional happens over here, and you can see it's taking off. That looks a bit like an exponential function. And we know it can't go on like that, because relatively uh, soon, there'll be more people than there will be space to actually, you know, fit on the Earth. Now, this uh, appreciation of exponential functions and how they must be effectively limited was the premise of an uh, influential and very controversial, a still controversial book, uh, published in 1972, and where they, they showed how, using a number of uh, very simple mathematical models, how not just population growth, but also resource consumption, you know, fossil fuel use, uh, food production, all these kind of things, there has to be some kind of limit. There has to be some process by which they slow down. Now, this wasn't a new idea at all. In fact, an equally, in fact, even more controversial book, uh, Malthus on Population, um, made the same observation. And Malthus said, look, if this green line is the exponential growth in population, then if you're around here, you may think that, you know, arithmetic, as he called it, or linear increases in food production might be able to keep up. But look, if you keep on going, you'll see that you'll never be able to outpace this exponential function, and soon it'll pretty much outpace any kind of food production system that you can imagine, because there are limits to how much extra food you can make. If you selectively breed crops to grow more, then there will always be uh, a limit to improvement, though we don't know exactly where it is, it's got to be somewhere. Now, Malthus was absolutely right about exponential functions, but he was wrong about where this point, or maybe even this point, might occur. This is a figure of the amount of food that's produced every uh, hectare. So it's killed in kilograms per hectare, which is you know, the amount of food that we can produce in a fixed unit of area. And this trend, if you go back further, is roughly kind of linear. It's kind of increasing. But then something really remarkable happens around 1960s to 1970s. It kind of takes off. <coughs> there was a massive increase in the, in the amount of food that the world system was able to produce. And... That's associated with this significant increase in the population size. The population size was purport, you know, increasing kind of linearly here, but then you see it takes off. It takes off around 1950s, 1960s. And the reasoning is, if there hadn't been that increase in food production, then many millions, if not billions, would have starved. What made that increase in food production possible? Well, it's become known as the Green Revolution. It was the increase in the use of pesticides in fertilisers, um, in water, in irrigation use, and also the development of new breeds, new strains of crops that produce higher yields or might be more resistant to drought and pests. And all that took energy. We didn't get these systems for free. Now, uh, here's a picture of a tree. As you know, trees grow on the ground. But really, in a sense, they grow from the sky. Uh, they're autotrophic organisms, they make their own food and they make it from sunlight, which solar radiation comes from down from the sky. Uh, they need water, which falls down from the sky from clouds, and they consume carbon dioxide. And they put these things together and they produce sugar, which is their fuel, and their waste product is oxygen. Now, many millions of years ago, a large number of trees uh, consumed carbon dioxide and grew, but then they died, and they were laid down, covered by sediment, and through a, a whole range of processes, essentially they were kind of squeezed and heated, those dead trees turned into coal, and other kind of photosynthetic organisms turned into gas or oil. And what we've been able to do, we've been able to dig up or extract that oil and then burn it. And what we do when we're burning it we release the stored carbon dioxide back into the Earth's atmosphere. In a way, we're storing, in a way, we're burning the stored sunlight that was captured many millions of years ago. And that energy we put to use to grow more food, but then also to keep the lights of our civilization on. Now, the effects of producing all this CO2 or unearthing all this carbon dioxide is having an effect on the global system. 
Um, this uh, it points along the uh, latitude in the sense of that's uh, the South Pole, there's the equator, there's the North Pole, and this axis here is carbon dioxide in parts per million. Now, in 1979, at this important uh, research station, Mauna Loa, the average amount of carbon dioxide that it was measuring was 336. And you can see that it's going up and down, up and down as the year progresses. So here we have that same data, but now in a kind of time series format. And it goes up and down. And basically, the reason it's going up and down is because the equator is around here, and there's more land mass north of the equator. That means there's more plants and trees north of the equator. And in the summer, the northern hemisphere summer, plants and trees draw in carbon dioxide, they grow, and in the northern hemisphere winter, when they drop their leaves and the vegetation dies back, they release that carbon dioxide back into the Earth's atmosphere. So this sinusoidal kind of uh, signal here is the biosphere breathing. It's breathing in and it's breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out carbon dioxide. Now, all things being equal, the amount that it breathes in would equal the amount that it breathes out, but all things are not equal. And you can see it's going up. There's a clear trend of increasing carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. And the reason that's there is because we're digging up and burning it. Now, if you go back further in time, you'll see that this increase was relatively progressive, but then it suddenly exploded in an exponential function type way. Now, we can show the effects of that increase in carbon dioxide um, with a nice little animation uh, courtesy of NASA. Um, this shows the temperature deviations from the average 1950s to 1980s temperature. So if it's very dark blue, it's two degrees cooler. And if it's very bright red, then it's two degrees warmer. And we can see that the Earth's climate is actually warming up. And the warmest years were towards the end of the 20th century and the start of uh, the new millennium. <clears throat> so, the first challenge is, how can we address global warming in terms of anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide? How can we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere? Um, and therefore, how can we lessen the effects we're having on the Earth's climate? Well, think about in this in a global context. The situation that we've got at the moment is that some countries have deposits of oil, and we uh, give them money in return for that oil, and then we burn that oil in order to power our civilization. And it's the burning of the oil which produces the carbon dioxide, which is the problem. So somehow we need to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide. So there are crops, for example, the oil palm here, uh, which grows very quickly and produces high yields of uh, vegetable oils. And when those oil palms grow, they absorb in an awful lot of carbon dioxide. What we can then do is we can convert those oil palms into actual vegetable oil. And then rather than give the money to countries that produce fossil fuels, we give the money to countries that produce the palm oil, and then we burn that instead. So we burn that in our biodiesel or maybe some other kind of um, biofuels. Now, we need somewhere to grow the palm oil. And the very productive places to grow palm oil are in the tropics. But there's not that much space, free space, just lying around ready to grow palm oil. So what we do is we take an indigenous rainforest and then we replace that with a palm oil plantation. Now, biofuels has been part of the story uh, of the deforestation of tropical rainforests. In this instance, if in this instance, it's Indonesia. Um, to put that number or area in some kind of context, it's about twice the surface area of Wales. Um, now, I've witnessed um, logging and uh, palm oil plantations in Indonesia and other places in Southeast Asia, and it's a profoundly depressing experience. Um, you go from these you know, magical environments... I spent all my life in cities, and so the first time I went to a rainforest, it was just this bonkers environment. Um, and you turn around a corner, and then it's as if some kind of enormous bomb has been exploded. There's just nothing left. However, trees might not really do it for you, but maybe other primates might. Now, associated with this deforestation is uh, a decrease in biodiversity. 
And there are enigmatic species like this. Uh, this is a female orangutan uh, with its infant that was rescued by the German charity Four Paws. Um, it appears that she'd been captured in order to be killed because there's a, a bounty or that some, some uh, organisations will pay people to bring in dead orangutans because they reason quite rightly that if they're not orangutans in bits of forest that they want to cut down to plant oil palm, then people tend not to worry so much about it. And through a number of other pressures, for example, hunting for bushmeat or for the pet trade, so they will kill the parents and then sell the offspring uh, to usually people overseas, there's been a precipitous collapse in the population of Sumatran orangutans. So uh, in that eight-year period, uh, the number was reduced by about half, and it's making the steady march towards extinction. Quite possibly, uh, there's not really going to be any left by the middle of the end of this century. <clears throat> and once again, I have a bit of a personal experience with orangutans. I spent some time in uh, rehabilitation centres. They take these little orphans, um, some of the parents have been killed by poachers and whatnot, and they teach them how to survive and how to, you know, make their way in the jungle. And it is a very emotional experience when a little uh, two-year-old orangutan plonks itself down next to you and starts playing with your camera or trying to pick your nose. Um, so these emotional responses, and we need to be careful about these emotional responses because it could be argued that, look, these challenges, these global challenges you know, unpleasant things are just necessary. We need to address them somehow, and you can't satisfy everyone all the time. However, with regards to the use of palm oil production in tropical rainforest areas, we can understand that even in those terms, there hasn't been an unqualified success, because in clearing the rainforest, often it's a slash-and-burn operation, which releases millions of tonnes of carbon dioxide. In fact depending on where the oil palm is planted and how the forest is removed, you can produce over 400, 420 times more carbon than you would uh, the annual reduction of using uh, biofuels rather than fossil fuels. So you'd have to run this system for centuries before you even broke even. So even in those terms, it's been something of a disaster. Now, that wasn't our intention. We didn't mean to do that. Um, it was a kind of uh, unforeseen consequence of our attempt to reduce CO2 emissions. And if we're not careful, there could be the danger that people think, well, why bother? You know, even when we try, we need to mess it up. And I want to try and show something. Right, what I want to show you is uh, the emissions of carbon dioxide. Right. What I want to show you is the emissions of carbon dioxide from the United Kingdom from about uh, the start of the 19th century... Um, and also China. Uh, China doesn't actually get into the game until about the start of the 20th century. And you can see there's a progressive trend of increasing CO2 emissions in the UK. Uh, and you see, well, here comes China. Right. Okay. And uh, for most of the 20th century, uh, the UK, a few ups and downs, usually caused by wars and other unpleasant things. Um, and it's not until about 1950s, 1960s, that China actually begins to catch up and then overtake and then suddenly explode. Now, this trend is approximately down. Uh, there's a long-term trend for the decrease in CO2 emissions in the United Kingdom. It did go up, I think, last year by about 8%, but the, the trend is down. The trend is not down in China. Um, uh, it's increasing at an increasing rate. In fact, that has the look of an exponential function. You know, do you think that's going to continue the way it is? Perhaps not. So... That might lead some people to uh, wonder, well, we can cut our emissions in the UK, but if countries such as China don't seem to be making any effort at all, then why bother? Why should we bother you know, reducing our quality of life or somehow constraining our economic freedom in order to reduce CO2 when other people aren't playing the same game? You know, it doesn't seem to be fair. I'm going to address that somewhat tangentially. Uh, this is a 2004 um, UK Health and Development Agency survey. What's, uh, what activity have you done? What's the most popular activity in the UK? What have you done in the last four weeks? And I'm proud, as a British person, to say that the most popular one is eating and drinking. <laughs> right? If it were an Olympic sport, I feel sure that we would bring home a medal this summer. Um, and some... You may notice this is an absolutely superb pub, the Square and Compass, uh, down uh, Swanage Way. It's a really fantastic pub. Um, what's our next popular activity? Shopping. Um, 
and that it really is. It's not, it's not going to the gym or walking or reading poetry to your wife. It's, uh, we basically, we eat, we drink and we shop. <clears throat> we are a consumerist society. We consume lots and lots of things. It's our leisure activity. We don't shop because we need these things. We shop because we like it. So, does that mean we make more things? Well, we do know that fewer people make things in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is time... And this is the percentage of people employed in manufacturing. Is it manufacturing or industry? Okay, it's industry workers, but a significant proportion of that would be in manufacturing. You can see there's a long-term decline. You know, we are pretty much a service economy now. Most people that you know, especially in the south of England, don't work in manufacturing industries. They work in service industries. They even work in education. Right. Is that because there's increased productivity? We need fewer people to make the same amount of things. Well, no, it's not actually, because look, this is another time series data. This goes back to 1960, and this shows the amount of money in terms of absolute amounts in uh, billions, but then also as a percentage of manufacturing output. How much of, one way to understand this, of every pound that you make by making something, how much of that pound do you then reinvest back into manufacturing? And for some time, there was a, it was a positive contribution. We are kind of investing a certain amount of money into manufacturing, but there's a trend which is declining. There's been a net dis or deinvestment in manufacturing in the United Kingdom such that now, and that trend does go on somewhat, uh, we've taken a large money out of manufacturing. And that's a story that can be told over my lifetime. Um, I, have a, I don't have many toys from my childhood, but I do have a box of toy cars. And um, they are, with a couple of exceptions, all made in England. In fact, this is a very special toy. Uh, it was made in 1972, year of my birth. So I was 40 this year, and it's okay. It's all right. And it was made in England because it was made by Matchbox. And all my cars are either Matchbox or Corgis. <clears throat> I spent some time in my son's preschool, they're like kindergarten the other day, and I ended up playing uh, with their cars for research purposes, and I turned them all over, and with a couple of exceptions, they were all made in China. Um, and now it's just common, it seems to be just uh, common sense that I can go around the corner to a shop and purchase something that was made the other side of the world. And that increase in Chinese goods can be correlated with the increase in the size of the Chinese economy. This is 1800 and uh, all the way up to 2008. And this is the amount of gross domestic product, basically how big the Chinese economy is. And it's you know, not really doing a great deal here until about 1940s, 60s, and then it takes off. That looks like an exponential function. Do you think it's going to go on like that? So really, when it comes to the emissions of carbon dioxide, and especially the emissions produced when we make things, it's not so much that we reduced our emissions, but rather we just exported them to China, who now make those things on our behalf. So the emissions have moved from here to here. And it's interesting to ask ourselves, well, how did that situation happen? It seems pretty extraordinary that we, uh, most of the, well, a large number of the things that we buy seem to be manufactured all the way around the other side of the world. And in answering that kind of question, you might want to think about people. For example, the respected leaders of the governments at the time. Let's take uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, conservative governments, who uh, famously confronted a number of the powerful unions in the United Kingdom, um, had monetarist policies, maybe promoted the movement of uh, industry into sectors such as the financial sector. But bear in mind, there is that longer-term trend of disinvestment in manufacturing. Or we can think about Deng Xiaoping, the uh, leader of the Chinese Communist Party, who famously said, look, it doesn't matter what colour the cat is as long as it catches mice. We can release uh, some of the constraints on free market uh, practices in China as long as it makes money and as long as it furthers the revolution, then it's fine. It doesn't matter. Or we can think a bit outside of the box by thinking about boxes. Now, if you were to hear somebody... Uh, Let's say you're sitting next, to a par uh, sitting next to somebody at a party and they turn to you and they say, do you know shipping containers are really the most interesting thing? You most will be looking for the exit. <laughs> but they are, right, and I'll try and make this as painless as possible. Um, they have revolutionised global trade. This is an average uh, cargo ship from the 1960s. It's got a displacement of about 800, 900 tonnes. Um, and notice these things here. These aren't masts, but these are cranes. 
these ships had their own cranes because the products that they would transport were all in different kind of containers, you know, sacks and pallets, all different types and sizes. And unloading and loading a ship like that would be an enormous manual intensive uh, uh, operation. So ports like Southampton would employ thousands and thousands of men. Fast forward a little bit to 1972 again. Um, we can see that kind of uh, cargo ship uh, up here, the one with the cranes. But now there's something interesting to look at over here. There's a different kind of ship. And there's a different kind of crane on the dock side. You might be able to make out there are some containers there. The 1960s and 70s is when containerization really took off as, as a means of transporting global trade. By having the same type of shipping container, so you could have the same type of uh, locking mechanism in the crane, the same kind of fitting mechanism on the ship, which could then have the same kind of shipping container put on a truck or a train, it standardised everything. You didn't have to have a lots and lots of different standard, uh, lots and lots of different uh, types of machinery to maintain. You just need one system. So now pretty much everything, 90%, over 90% of world trade, is carried in these 20 or 40 foot standard shipping containers and this is a picture of Southampton docks today pretty much everything that comes in and out of this place is in these boxes the more boxes that you can transport per ship means that it's cheaper to transport the same amount and that has led to uh, an increase in the size of ships uh, this is the Emma Mask and when she was launched she was the largest container ship in the world uh, 170,000 tonnes uh, this ship can carry somewhere between 13 to 15,000 standard shipping containers. And to put it into some kind of context, uh, here she is over there. She's bigger than the Queen Mary uh, II. She's bigger than the nuclear-powered USS Enterprise aircraft carrier. The only thing that's bigger than her is the super tanker Nock Nevis. And that trend is going to increase. They're already building even bigger ships. Bigger ships allow more movements. Um, this uh, 2010 study shows the density of movements of uh, shipping and cargo. If it's dark red, there's less than 10, but it goes all the way over to more than 5,000 journeys. And you can see where the bright yellow lines are, and the main node in this network is China. In 2009, there were over 100 million movements of shipping containers within China and into and out of the Chinese mainland. And that's associated with a change in the import and export uh, properties or behaviours of our respective countries. So this is the United Kingdom in orange and China in red. This is time again. And this is the trade balance. This dash blue line means that if you're above this line, you export more goods than you import. If you're underneath it, you import more than you export. And you can see that they are you know, bobbling along this blue line until the 1990s or so. And there's a strong divergence the United Kingdom became a real net importer of products, whilst China became this enormous exporting powerhouse. From a UK perspective, this is our economic miracle. You know, that period of low inflation where we were earning more and more, we could afford more and more products. The reason, because we weren't making them, we were importing them. So, the situation was that we had some money and China had some goods, and we exchanged those goods for services. Uh, we changed that money for, for goods. And then when we wanted some more, well, what happened? We kind of ran out of money. But there were large cash surpluses in China. And so they lent us some. They said, we've got so much money. You can have some on, on a kind of form of credit, which then we sent back, uh, in order to allow them to make more things to then give us more products and services. And this system went on and on for a while, building up larger and larger financial reserves, which would allow uh, China or other main exporting countries, to a certain extent Germany as well, to provide more and more cheap credit, which inflated more and more asset bu bubbles, famously the US housing market. How stable is that system? Well, hindsight is 2020 because it wasn't very stable at all. It rapidly unwound in a series of kind of positive feedback loops where they realised that the people who couldn't pay and they were beginning to unravel the, the debt that was securitised and then sent on and through these massively complex financial institutions. But the headline story is that imbalance unwound. So... The point of this story is, is that in considering carbon dioxide emissions and what role we, as individuals or as a country, should take, we've already begun to consider a whole range of issues. 
because the global challenges are multifaceted. We're not going to solve these problems just by coming at it from one angle. We need to take a broader perspective. And one reason is because of this notion of unintended consequences. If there's going to be a poster species for unintended consequences, I vote for this one. Um, and the reason is as follows. Um, cane sugar. Cane sugar is a very, very attractive uh, cash crop. Um, you produce cane syrup from it, which is sweet and yummy, and everybody likes it, and you can sell it and make a lot of money. It grows um, in Southeast Asia, but in the 19th century it was introduced to Australia because where the cane uh, sugar was growing, uh, it was quite similar to uh, northeastern Queensland. And so they reasoned that if we plant it there, we'll make lots of money. This was fantastic news to an indigenous beetle, which is now known as the cane beetle, because it, or rather its larva, decimated these uh, cane sugar crops. <coughs> but they thought they had a solution. There's a toad, a toad that lives, it's indigenous to Central and South America. And uh, this toad here absolutely loves to eat this kind of beetle. And they'd introduced that toad into certain other uh, areas in Southeast Asia, which had the same kind of problem. And it had been uh, relatively successful. So that's what they did. They introduced the cane toad. <laughs> Uh, and the cane toad was going to eat the cane beetles, and then that was going to protect the crops, and it's a win-win situation. This is a distribution of uh, cane toads in 1945. They were introduced in the late 1930s. And this shows how the distribution of cane toads changed over the following decades. In 2008, they were by this brown line here, and uh, a relatively recent, let's see, a 2008 modelling uh, paper based on current and projected climates in Australia, they think the cane toad's going to end up around this green shaded area. In 1935, 100 or so cane toads were brought into Australia, and by the end of 2010, there were over 200 million. One of the reasons they've done so well in Australia is because they have a particular defence mechanism. Uh, when a cane toad gets uh, stressed out, uh, it inflates its chest and stands on its legs and tries to look as big as possible. Then it also produces this milky white fluid here from these large glands. There's a big complicated biological word for that, which I can never remember. Anyway, uh, that milky substance is toxic, it's a poison. If you were to ingest enough of that, it would kill you. So, as well as cane toads eating lots of small creatures, you know, rodents and lizards and other amphibians, anything, well, many species that would naturally predate upon cane toads would eat one cane toad, and it would never eat another one because it would be dead. Now, that, the fact that they've had such a you know, dramatic impact on biodiversity, and the fact that they're not the prettiest animals in the world, I grant you, has made killing cane toads into something of a national obsession in Australia, <laughs> The preferred method of dispatch is apparently with a golf club, which sounds pretty messy, although somebody was telling me the other day that they killed cane toads with bleach, which I just find hor horrific. Anyway, um, the, U uh, the Australian government has supported uh, this activity of citizens by uh, spending on the order of 2 million Australian dollars between 2008 and 2010, I believe that expenditure is ongoing, in programmes to try and limit the spread of cane toads. And I think uh, the performance has been pretty patchy at best. And perhaps the final irony of this situation is cane toads didn't even really eat the cane beetles. Um, the kind of plantations in Australia are not in the environments where cane toads want to live. So even on that basis, uh, the introduction was a bit of a disaster. Now... This kind of behaviour we often observe in things called complex systems, right? Um, and a complex system is a system which is composed of many elements. Now, individually, the elements look quite simple, and we think we might understand them really rather well. But what happens when they get together is something really rather surprising. You know, we understood that cane toads eat cane beetles, and we understand that cane beetles eat cane sugar. But there was a kind of a, a synergistic element that when the whole thing was put together, something surprising happened. And we can see that in much simpler systems. For example, this is a termite, and on its own, behaviourally, it's not very interesting. It might just wander around aimlessly. However, you put millions of these together, and you have many, many generations, then they can build something like this. This is a termite mound. Um, and as well as being impressively large, 
uh, there are many feats of engineering that they produce. These are kind of chimneys which regulate temperature and pressure to within uh, temperature and humidity to within really narrow bounds to these big underground chambers. And this thing goes way, way, way down. So I want to give you an example of an emergent system. Um, and it's based on three simple, seemingly not very interesting rules. And the first rule, um, which I like to demonstrate, is that you don't want to get too close. So if you are walking around or at a party or something, then there's a thing about personal proximity that if you start getting a bit close to people, it's a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> but, but similarly, you don't want to get too far. Um, you don't want to be too far away from somebody. Um, and if you're all walking the, um, around, you want to walk in the same kind of direction. You don't want to be continually bumping into people. So three simple rules, but what emerges is something uh, perhaps somewhat counterintuitive. Now, there is a bit of sound on this that I want to make sure that I get working properly. So please bear with me. Right. Right, let's get to that island then. I can see an animal. Where? This is three. I can see something flying low. I, bet, I reckon it's like a coot or something. And two swans. Oh, look up. Oh, wow. So, word for the day, murmuration. Um, that's an emergent system. Um, all those birds and tens, if not hundreds of thousands of starlings were behaving in accordance to those simple rules. They were just trying to keep not too close, not too far, and generally head in the same direction. Now, the flocking of birds was once thought to be something of a mystery. Are there kind of leader birds that all the other birds are following? Um, and it was Craig Reynolds in, in the mid-1980s that produced or proposed those three rules to explain uh, flocking behaviour in birds and fish and other species. Um, and he produced a simulation called Boyd's. Um, this is a recent implementation. These are little di digital creatures. Uh, the flapping is just for cosmetic reasons. And they're they are following those three rules. Um, there's a couple of predator, bigger birds, in order to make the flock move around. Um, and it's these kind of emergent systems, these kind of complex systems, that I'm interested in and I study at the Institute for Complex Systems Simulation. Now, outside, you may have noticed uh, there were some posters. Uh, we've taken the liberty to put some posters up and uh, to make this segment of the show a little bit of an advert. Um, I suppose I see many of these global challenges intellectually as challenges of systems. We might understand within our own discipline or domain of experience or knowledge how this particular bit of the Earth system works. But what we are fumbling for, what we're trying to understand, is how this system interacts with another system. Um, and that's, the, uh, I suppose, one of the starting points for uh, complexity science. So, <coughs> this leads on to more general issues about what do we do as a university. If intellectually I'm interested in this because they are complex systems, how do we as a university get engaged with addressing these global challenges? Well, one of the things that we're meant to do in a university education is equip our students 
with the skills and experience they need in order to go on and prosper in future life. And I think that it's absolutely the case that that's going to be enabling them to work in multidisciplinary environments, to understand these challenges, not just global challenges, but the other kind of relatively mundane challenges they're going to have, which a relatively narrow specialist education might not equip them for. But there's something more. There's actually uh, a kind of a moral responsibility that we, uh, as a university, have. Um, and that is that the young people who come to this university, and the people who will in future, maybe some of the people who don't even exist yet, future generations, they didn't cause these problems. They didn't needlessly pollute or um, deplete resources or have an impact on biodiversity. But look, they're the ones who are going to have to fix it. So we're the ones who cause the problem, so we have a moral responsibility to equip them with the skills that they will need individually and as a society to address these challenges. So how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing that we're going to try is a new undergraduate module. It's called Global Challenges. And the important thing to uh, bear in mind here is it's going to be open to all undergraduates from all departments. Anyone can get involved. And at the heart of the module is going to be this idea of multidisciplinary teams. You're going to form uh, teams composed of someone from a humanities uh, degree or a science degree, and they're going to work together. They're going to stay in the same team, and they're going to progress through the course. Now, if you were to ask your average computer scientist what they thought a philosopher was, then maybe an image like this might pop, unbidden into their head. It's an old guy with a beard who talks about dead Germans in indecipherable sentences. If you were to ask maybe a computer scientist, uh, if you ask a philosopher what a computer scientist was, then they might think somebody like this. Um, a person who is only really able to relate to machines might stumble with interpersonal relationships. <clears throat> if we were to ask a philosopher or a computer scientist, what does a natural scientist do? What does, say, a biologist do? They might think of something like this. It's a guy, uh, maybe with a beard, most probably with glasses, but he will definitely have a white coat. We're not sure why he's got a white coat. Uh, maybe it's like wearing a, a tie in an office or something, and he's looking at things, like, really intently. <coughs> now... I have a certain amount of sympathy uh, for these characters because over my time I've played all of them. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in philosophy. I went on to do uh, a Master of Science and a PhD in a Centre for com uh, Computational Neuroscience and Robotics. Then I went on to work as a research uh, scientist uh, at an Institute for Biogeochemistry. And now I'm at Southampton University in the Department of Electronics and Computer Scientist. But we need to get students out of their relatively narrow disciplines and appreciate how different people approach maybe what seems to be the same subject from different angles. So the course will, within their teams, expose them, educate them uh, to the global challenges that I've already talked about. Now, the format is that we've got um, internal and external speakers. It's like a, a guest lecture format, and we've already got quite an exciting list of people to uh, come and give talks and lectures. Then, in their teams, they talk about these issues in group seminars, and then we, then we want them, at the end of the module, to produce some innovative assessments. Yes, there will be an exam, but we hope that they will get together and collectively produce some artefact or media, perhaps something like this. We have heard a lot of stories about the impact of the Internet on protest movements heard a lot about the information revolution and how it's transforming countries like China, countries like Iran. Even okay, this is one of the uh, animations from the RSA Animate series. You can find them all on YouTube and they really are excellent. Um, the lecture itself is really good. It's an interesting lecture, but the animation process really does allow it to connect to a much broader range of people. Uh, it brings the subject to life. Um, and here are some other examples. Um, this is another little uh, short video. This is trying to convey the notion of what, a, what is a trillion? How big is a trillion? In this context, um, information technology. Um, some of the other things that we could imagine our teams producing would be a, a lesson plan for a primary school teacher in uh, addressing one of the global challenges, or maybe a presentation to a CEO or boardroom of a large multinational corporation. Or perhaps an infographic 
Um, the popularity of infographics has you know, exploded, perhaps exponentially. Maybe we're too late, I don't know. But they can be really wonderful ways of communicating a large amount of data. And despite my ineptitude at showing you the GapMind application, I think that application is maybe the state of the art at the moment. It really does bring what could be boring, dry statistics to life. Now, to focus everybody's attention on this and try and generate a bit of momentum, we're running a competition, right? <clears throat> now, if there's one thing I want you to do after you leave this room. I want you to tell everyone that we're giving away £1,000. There's a first prize of £1,000. Um, the other thing you need to remember is that you need to enter by the 1st of July... And if you want some more information on how to register, how to enter the details of the competition, then it's the new website, globalchallenges.sutton.at.uk. Basically, we want in, uh, teams... We're not going to enforce this uh, team application procedure, but we think in order to have a good chance of winning £1,000, you're going to need to have a multidisciplinary team, and we want to produce some kind of artefact, some short video or something, something which engages with the global challenge and tries to communicate it to somebody. Right. To conclude... Um, I've been trying to promote this notion of multidisciplinary response to global challenges, right? And there is a risk here that if we overplay the challenges, if we, um, if, if we continually state how big they are, how complex they are, how we all need to somehow get together and work these issues out together somehow, that we um, take a whole series of small, challenging, but tractable problems, and we make one big complicated thing which is effectively intractable, we can't possibly solve it we kind of turn these global challenges into like a Gordian knot we can't find out where the end is and if we're not careful this can lead to a feeling of powerlessness You know, what can I as, in, as an individual possibly do to make this situation any worse now to address that I want to go back to that film I showed at the start um, and this is a still from it, you remember this woman um, Previous to that, I think most people had assumed that the guy, you know, Brandon, was dead. But it was her looking under the car who discovered that he was alive. And then she told everybody about that. And this is interesting. The next thing she did was she went and tried to pick up the car. She didn't wait for anybody to start joining. And she went there. And the thing I find interesting about this is arms straight, knees slightly bent, hips raised, back engaged. That's quite a good deadlift position, actually. Um, now, the point is she's trying. It's not some kind of token effort. She's trying very, very hard to lift that car. And she weighs, what, 50 kilos? That car must weigh over 1,000 kilos. It's impossible. And she knows it's impossible to lift the car, but she tries. Now, if there's one thing that I want someone to take home with them after they've been through the Global Challenges module, and hopefully at some point in the future, when they've been a student at the University of Southampton, is that they can get engaged with these global issues. They can try. They can make a difference. They are relatively important. If you would like to know more about the module, if you'd like to know more about the competition, then please uh, visit the uh, website. Um, I'm sorry for starting late. Um, I, uh, I appreciate your uh, patience. There is food and refreshment outside, and there are posters, and I would love to talk to you about any of the issues that I've talked about. Thank you very much.